What is up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Rewired Soul Podcast. It is your host, Chris, and welcome back to another episode during this week of scientific thinking and having healthy conflict. All right. And today I have an awesome, awesome guest. I I recently fell in love with uh, his work and it's Lee McIntyre. He is a philosopher of science. He's the first person I came across who actually uh, is a philosopher of science, but now I have met more uh, such as people like Andy Norman and things like that. But anyways, anyways, this book that we're going to be discussing today is one of his uh, recent books. He has a new book coming out, but his last book was called The Scientific Attitude. And check this out. So I, I try to think about, you know, like, what what am I trying to accomplish with these conversations? And why do I read the books that I read from these authors? And something I've mentioned before is that, you know, understanding that, you know, we need a better way of thinking, uh, it pretty much saved my life. And I think the word science can be a little scary because I, I personally, when I hear the word science, I think of like dudes with like white lab coats and like beakers and like doing experiments and stuff like that. But more so, I, I think the scientific thinking is important, right? Like with my mental health, I think it's important to question my thinking and my thoughts and my beliefs and things like that. In my relationships and my opinions about things, it's important to sit back and kind of analyze them. And, and I realize that this is part of the scientific process. So when I read Lee's book called The Scientific Attitude, I'm like, yes. That's it. It's the scientific attitude. So the book is incredible, but I think it really kind of sums it up that it helps us kind of look in all aspects of our life and kind of develop this, what Lee calls the scientific attitude. Now, uh, in this conversation, we'll talk a lot about, you know, science and research and things like that. But something I'm hoping that you all do, all of you wonderful people in the audience do, is something that I do where I'm always reading these books and saying, like, what can I learn from this? How can I improve just a little bit from this knowledge and wisdom that I'm acquiring? And something that's been so, so beneficial to me is developing this kind of scientific attitude where I question things, but I also learn to trust certain things and all that kind of stuff. All right. But before we get started, if you're new to the podcast, make sure you are subscribed to it. If you're on uh, Apple podcast, if you're on Spotify, follow it. And over on Apple, make sure you leave a rating and review what that does. We're a brand new podcast. Only been around a couple months. All right. But it helps the algorithm. It says, Hey, people like this thing. Let's send it out to some more people. But something else you could do, something else you could do to help your boy Chris is to share these episodes on social media. Um, I'm really, really passionate about uh, especially, especially these conversations that we're having this week. So I hope that you share them. But anyways, anyways, without further ado, here's my conversation with Lee McIntyre as we talk about his book, which will be linked down in the description below, The Scientific Attitude. Hey Lee, thank you for coming onto the podcast and and welcome. So yeah, let's jump right into this thing. I absolutely loved the scientific attitude. And once I started getting into it, like I, I could not put it down. And before reading your book, I hadn't heard of a scientific philosopher. So For those in the audience who have yet to read the book, can you explain what a scientific philosopher is and how the study benefits your students as well as the average person out there? Hi, Chris. Thank you so much for having me on The Rewired Soul. I would say in the, what I am as a philosopher of science, and we don't really use the word uh, scientific philosopher, there's this debate uh, over whether Uh, all of philosophy can be a science or whether ethics can be a science. What a philosopher of science does is study science. Um, We apply our analytical skills to the uh, concepts and ideas of scientific explanation and theorizing, uh, etc. And um, sometimes that work is not appreciated by scientists. Sometimes it is. But the point is that there's a logic of science and a kind of a a way of understanding what's really 
foundational about scientific explanation, and that's what philosophers of science are interested in. In its main point, I would say philosophers of science are interested in the question of what is science and what is not science. And that's a very uh, foundational question, uh, as we we can talk about a little bit more later if you'd like. Um, the main thing, I think, about the um, coming up with the idea of what is science and what is not is that if you understand what science is, that will help you to push back against the things that are not science but are pretending to be science, like the pseudosciences. And it will also help you to push back against science deniers, who are these people who just have this unrealistic view of what science really is. So if you've got, a, as a philosopher of science, a, a, a credible view of what science is, then it helps you to push back against science deniers who are always making these sorts of claims uh, about uh, what science has to be, that science has to be perfect, it has to be able to prove its results, etc. You're hearing in the background there my, my dog walking around. It's still COVID rules, even though it's it's June, so that's just part of it. Yeah, that, that makes total sense. I love how you put that. Like, when you start to kind of break down what science is, you can start looking at what science isn't. And, yeah, and something I try to, you know, talk to people about and teach people is, you know, we're, we're surrounded by science. So when we're looking at, you know, like uh, these these natural cures and things like that that get pushed upon us and all of that, just so many different things, like it's helpful to just kind of get into that mindset because we're, we're regularly putting things into our body or refusing to like when we're talking about you know uh vaccines and anti-vax and all that kind of stuff so so yeah i love i love the way that you put that like once we figure out what science is we can start moving some of the other stuff to the side and i know you talk about pseudoscience and all that in the book but um but yeah uh i i wanted to also talk to you about um you know so for example, for me, I had this point of, you know, quote unquote, like waking up when I realized that scientists are people just like everyone else. They're susceptible to biases and errors and sometimes even fraud. Right. And we're we're inundated with news about like the latest data and research and studies. But most people don't realize that they may need to be looking at this news with a little bit more skepticism, right? So I'm not a scientist or a philosopher, obviously, right? But books like yours help me out tremendously as I receive information on a daily basis, just like everybody else does. And as a recovering addict who got sober in AA and NA back in 2012, I thought it was really cool how you put together a sort of 12 step method for adopting this, you know, what you call a scientific attitude. So can you discuss what the scientific attitude is and how you believe it can kind of have practical application out there for all of us non-scientists? Um, in the book, I make the argument that the scientific attitude is the thing that really makes science special, uh, not the scientific method, because I think that there is no scientific method. There's no uh, logical recipe which you can follow and just magically do science. Instead, I think that what really uh, demarcates science from non-science is the ethos that scientists have, this community feeling that um, evidence counts. And so I define the scientific attitude in the following way. Step one, Scientists care about evidence. Step two, they're willing to change their mind based on new evidence. And that's really it. I mean, it's not 12 steps, it's two, right? Um, scientists have to be responsive to new evidence. If they're not willing to change their views based on new evidence, then they're really not a scientist because science is responding to empirical phenomena. And if you look at ideologues, um, uh, you know, of, of any type, just people who say, I will not change my mind no matter what you say to me, no matter what the evidence is, then they're really not scientists. Um, what else to say about this is that I think that the reason that this works so well in science, this scientific attitude, uh, is because it helps you to keep from thinking that you know what you don't know. All right. Um, it is a kind of a guard against this, the hubris of thinking 
that you really, you know, that your theory can never be overthrown because really in science, any theory can be overthrown. And I think that you're right that that does have a practical application too to real life um, because we have a lot of hubris in our real life, not just uh, as scientists, but as human beings where we think that we know something when we don't. And the beautiful thing about um, this idea of the scientific attitude is it's really an open-minded attitude. It's this idea that we should be open to learning new things and change our mind when we do. Absolutely. And this is this is something I think about uh, a lot, like not, not to toot my own horn and uh, play into my own hubris, but I, I sit back and, and think like, you know, where, where did I get this kind of like uh, intellectual humility where I, I sit back and I'm like, I don't, I don't know that much. And, and, and I, I look back because I know when it happened, that, that kind of point was when I got sober and the thing that saved my life was like, oh, wow, I don't know everything. You know what I mean? And then that's when I finally started listening to others, taking advice and talking to people like yourself who know a lot more about certain things than I do. And, and yeah, it, it's really interesting because I, I try to understand why that is so difficult for us, why we can't sit back and say, hey, here's the thing that we don't know. And, you know, why is it so hard for us to update our beliefs? That's one of the reasons I, I read so many books, just trying to understand human behavior and just why our brain just does not want us to update beliefs and so many things like that. And uh, I'm not going to spoil your new book that's coming out later this year that I got an advanced copy of. But, you know, uh, some of it, you know, uh, that, that you discuss is is you know, our identity. Right. Um, but, but yeah, so something I really appreciate about this book is your whole outlook on, you know, uh, the, the fraud that happens in the scientific community. Like I'm personally a firm believer, which helps me keep my sanity too, but I'm a firm believer in Hanlon's razor, right? Which states, you know, never attribute to malice that which is adequately explained by stupidity. So in the book, when you discuss fraud, you tend to give people the benefit of the doubt and and you, you know, you you assume that they probably just made a human error just like anybody else would. But you also discuss that people like Andrew Wakefield, the guy who started the whole anti-vax movement, um, he, he purposely and knowingly misled people about his research on this non-existent link between vaccines and autism. So my, my next question for you is, in a world where there are scientists who make honest mistakes as well as bad actors in the scientific community, it's difficult to know what accountability and consequences should look like. So I guess if it was up to you, what would accountability in the scientific community look like? This is a very easy answer. It would look just like it looks uh, when scientists are policing for fraud. Uh, fraud detection is one of the things that scientists do extremely well, because if you think about it, it is really the one form of scientific heresy, this scientific dishonesty, because if you commit fraud, then you're saying that something is true, even when you know it's not true, or you know that you don't have the evidence to support it. And then other scientists will build on that. And so accountability in the scientific community means sharing your work. Uh, sharing your data, uh, being open to correction when you're wrong, um, not committing fraud. These are the values uh, that are behind this ethos of science. And I really wouldn't change anything about how science does that because it really does that quite well. I love it. I, I love it just with keeping it short and sweet. You know what I mean? Uh, but yeah, but yeah, there are these checks and balances. And I think, I think something that even I struggle with is that, you know, sometimes we have this weird expectation, you know, that, that, you know, some, some, you know, field should be perfect. Right. And we always, you know, or sometimes uh, we forget that there is this human element and there are going to be bad actors and things like that. And the thing is, is that science does have these kind of checks and balances and peer reviews and, and so many different things. I think I think my main concern, one of the reasons I like asking this, I asked uh, Stuart Ritchie um, when we talked about his book, Science Fictions, too, it's it's I don't know if it's just, you know, my perception of it, but it seems like the corrections and things like that don't get nearly 
as much attention as the claims, or if we go back to, you know, the Andrew Wakefield uh, anti-vax movement and stuff like that, like even though that has been retracted from uh, the journal that it was published in and all that kind of stuff, and there's been so much coverage on it, there is still an entire community of people who firmly believe that. And, and I don't know, I'm always just kind of looking for like new answers, like how do we stop this from happening? Um, but yeah, so in the book, uh, you talk a bit about the line of demarcation in science. And you're even self-aware that some scientists and readers may think your definition of science is, you know, uh, too broad. So as someone like myself, like I really, really, really enjoy the social sciences and psychological research. So I'm glad that you discussed the demarcation problem as it pertains to these specific fields. So for those who don't know, can you explain what the, what demarcation is and what problems it faces in the scientific community? What you're really asking about in this question, I think, is the problem of demarcation. And the problem of demarcation is really the defining problem in the philosophy of science. It's about 100 years old, and it's what happened to split the field off, really, from epistemology about 100 years ago when we were concerned as a field with this question of demarcating science from pseudoscience or science from non-science. Here's the dirty secret. This problem has never been solved, and I'm not sure that it can be solved. Um, about 30 years ago, there was a paper by a famous philosopher of science named Larry Loudon called The Demise of the Demarcation Problem. And he was basically saying that this problem can't be solved because what you would have to do to solve it is to come up with a set of necessary and sufficient criteria that could logically demarcate perfectly every single time between something that was scientific and something that wasn't. And that is just something that has eluded philosophers all of these years. I think that the it's not necessary to solve the problem of demarcation in order to do philosophy of science. What we're really about in the philosophy of science is talking about what's special about science. And as I hope to show through the scientific attitude, you can still talk about what's special about science without solving the problem of demarcation. And I'm at some pains in the book to make it clear that um, I don't see the scientific attitude as a solution to the problem of demarcation. I do see it as an answer to the question of what's special about science. By the way, um, you mentioned the social sciences. So it's even harder with the social sciences to talk about demarcation. You know, that's where things get really difficult. Is psychology a science? How about economics? How about history? Okay, it was one of the social sciences. How about sociology? So I think that the thing that those fields are often missing is not adherence to some logical criteria or the scientific method that we talked about before, which maybe doesn't even exist, but the scientific attitude, this idea that you're going to change your views based on new evidence. The problem with a lot of the social sciences, I think, is that they're too ideological. They're engaging in confirmation bias, and they're not changing their mind when they get new evidence. Yeah, it's it's really it's really tricky. And before I kind of jumped into this whole niche of like understanding like science and the scientific method and like peer review and what good research looks like and all of that stuff, like I was just reading so many books on psychology and mainly mental health. Like a lot of my content was like mental health and addiction recovery and all this stuff. And there was just so many, so many things out there where it's like, oh, this can help and this can help and this can help, right? And I'm like, nice. And I was teaching that to my audience and all of that. And then when I started realizing how many famous studies like these have this, uh, uh, replication problem, I'm like, oh God, right? So something else I, I talk about quite a bit uh, is the placebo effect. And that's something I'm always just kind of on the fence about, like, is it really bad? Is, is it bad if, you know, for example, I was talking with Stuart Ritchie about, uh, in his book, he talks about like the power pose uh, that's been kind of debunked and the power pose makes you feel more confident and stuff like that. And it's like, well, if somebody does the power pose and they feel more confident and they get things done, is that necessarily bad? And, and all of that. But uh, I, I do think that you, you bring up a great point. It's, 
you know, it's more of an issue of, you know, updating this information and, um, you know, being willing to go back and check and all that kind of stuff, because that's what science is about. Like in my, in my kind of view, it's just one reason that, uh, you know, the scientific attitude and the reason I, you know, I respect it and try to think like that is, is we're doing our best to get as close to the truth as possible you know what i mean so so yeah it's it's really interesting in that kind of niche uh area of uh the, the scientific research so in the book uh you wrote quite a bit about uh pseudoscience and on a daily basis on a daily basis i am baffled as to why people believe these pseudoscientific claims like it's it's 2021 and there are people who believe that essential oils and crystals can cure these mental and physical problems and yeah like i was just saying like sometimes i'm like on the fence like does it really matter if they're getting like the benefits of the the, the placebo effect but anywho at, at the ripe age of uh 35 just turned 36 i finally decided to learn about investing and I've seen how many people promote various types of analyses and uh, they they don't have any scientific uh, accuracy right so I don't know if you've had the same experience but it seems as though many people prefer to not adopt any sort of scientific attitude so I'm curious do you think that this is because people prefer to stay in denial and not scrutinize their personal beliefs or for lack of better words, do you think it's more so just ignorance and that people just don't know what good research looks like? I think that it's important here to draw a distinction between what scientists do and the ethos that's behind it. Okay, So I think that people get caught up in pseudoscience often because what they're they have a misunderstanding of what science actually is, and they're trying to copy it in a way um, that is not really res respecting what's spe uh, special about it. There's something called scientism, which is when you copy uh, you know, the methods of science, you copy the procedures of science, but you're not really looking at you know, what's most essential, which I believe, again, I called the book The Scientific Attitude. Okay. So I think that what's going on here is that um, when people don't actually understand what science is, it's easy to make a mistake. It's easy to think that pseudoscience, um, you know, crystal healing, essential oils, all of this stuff is really just as good as science. Um, when people are science deniers, they misunderstand science. One of the main problems with science deniers is that they think that science is perfect. They think that science deals in proof and certainty and that, you know, they'll often say, well, you know, well, if you can't prove it, then how do I know it's true? Anybody who's done science understands that science is not about proof and certainty. Science is about evidence. Uh, science is not logic. You can't prove something deductively. Uh, there's an argument over whether science uses induction. But what's really clear is that in science, which is another type of reasoning, but what's really clear is that in science, anything that you believe can be overthrown by new evidence, which means that Nothing can ever be proven. It's always subject to being overthrown at some later point. And that's what I think is essential. If people actually grasp that point, which I think is the essential point behind the scientific attitude, that in order to be a scientist, you have to be willing to change your mind based on new evidence, then I think that that is a kind of a razor that cuts out pseudoscience and it cuts the legs out from under science denial because it shows what is actually, I believe, so special about science? Yeah, and that's that's something else I, I I really loved about the book, and I wish we had more time to like to talk about it. But something something that you discuss in the book is that listen, like if you want to do scientism or you know replicate you know what you consider science to be, you have to be willing to put it up to the same scrutiny and all of that right so you you have to be willing like if you if you want uh essential oils or crystals or whatever whatever it is to be accepted by the scientific community then okay do your research 
put it out there for peer review, let people pick it apart, try to disprove it, you know, and all these other things. But that's something that, you know, we, we don't see. And it, I, I, it almost seems like people are just kind of picking and choosing what, you know, what aspects of science they want to do and other ones that they don't and, and all of that, you know. Um, but yeah, kind of like you, you touched on too, a lot of it is this kind of mis, this misunderstanding of what science is and is science like, you know, definitive and perfect and all that stuff but no uh, you know things are things are updated things are regularly being tested and looked at and, and all all sorts of stuff um but yeah so to kind of to kind of follow up on that previous question uh the last year during the covid pandemic has shown how powerful misinformation and conspiracy theories can be and many of us have noticed how this has caused a lot of conflict between friends and family members there are even people who have like divorced uh their their significant other their spouse because of the conspiracies they believe or the bad science and i'm I, i'm sure you have plenty of experience debating people who believe in pseudoscience uh or conspiracies so what's the best advice you can give for people who are you know who want to have these conversations but you know uh how can we better manage our emotions in these types of situations when we're debating about what is or isn't true you put your finger on something really important here in november 2018 i went to the flat earth international conference in denver colorado and when you're in a situation like that when you're talking to science deniers you have to be cool i mean you have to be ice cold the first day I was incognito, they didn't know that I didn't believe what they believed because I was trying to learn what they believed in order to more effectively try to persuade them. Now, here's the point, though. The second day, even when I was trying to persuade them, I was still cool. You cannot... Anger doesn't work. Shoving facts down people's throat doesn't work. Insulting them does not work. When you're talking to somebody who's a science denier and you're trying to convince them, you have to remember one very important thing. Their beliefs are probably based on identity, not on facts. So facts are not going to convince them. What does convince them, uh, if anything will, is to build trust. And how do you build trust? You show up in person. You're patient. You listen. You show respect. You show empathy. Um, it's, it's really important to try to build a relationship. Now, going to the Flat Earth Convention, 650 to 1, and only being there for two days, you know, I didn't have much success because I, you know, I'm trying from a cold start to build a relationship. But suppose you're talking to somebody that you're already close to. So you, they already trust you. You've already built up the relationship. How should you approach it? You need to uh, be calm. Uh, when we're close to people, sometimes we think, oh, it's okay to get angry. That just turns them off. I got a heart-wrenching phone call uh, a few months back from a woman who had read uh, a paper that I did, an essay that was the cover story of Newsweek in, uh, in June 2019 called uh, The Earth is Round, <laughs> okay? And um, her husband had become a flat earther, and she wanted to know what to say to him, how to convince him. And what I talked to her, and I mean, it just it broke my heart. And what I talked to her about was that she needed to express that she disagreed with him. She thought he was wrong, but she still loved him. And that it was important for him to express that he still loved her and still loved their children, and that he couldn't ignore them, that you know he needed to be engaged. That was really important. Now, for privacy's sake, I didn't check back with her and see whether it had worked. But there are many, many things I've read about anecdotal accounts. This hasn't really been studied scientifically. Anecdotal accounts that the way that you uh, convince a science denier to change his or her mind is through um, empathy, through respect, through engagement, and you know, speaking to them kindly. Yeah, and and that's I, it's good that people you know reach out, but this is. This is something that I, I think about quite a bit because I, I like to think that, uh, you know, I have a pretty high threshold for getting upset, getting angry and, you know, and all of that. And, you know, I, I still find myself 
trying to figure out how to stay cool, right? How do you talk to somebody who believes something so seemingly silly and, and talk to them like, you know, just, just normal and with compassion and empathy and all that. And when I look around, I see this stuff constantly, right? Like uh, you, you kind of just, you know, mentioned it. Like you, when you went to the Flat Earther Convention, you had to keep your cool. And when I'm looking, when I'm looking at whether it's like uh, people doing, you know, commentary, whether it's on YouTube or other podcasts or, you know, whatever it is, I'm just like, I'm sitting there, I'm like, do you, do you think that you're really going to convince anybody? Do you think that the other person uh, who you disagree with is going to come to your side with the way that you are talking to them, right? And it's something that I have to think about. It's something that I've had to think about for a long time, just even working in addiction treatment. Um, sometimes I just wanted to shake people who relapsed multiple times and saying like, what are you doing? You are killing yourself. But I had to look back and I'm like, wait, that never worked on me, right? How would I want to be talked to if I was in this situation? And I think that kind of uh, perspective taking and asking myself, like, how would I react if somebody talked to me like this and somebody, you know, tried to be condescending or like question my intelligence or whatever? I'm like, oh, pfft. I wouldn't react very kindly. And, and that kind of helps me have better conversations um, with other people. And I'm, I'm, I haven't had people reach out to me, you know, when it comes to science denial yet, but it's something that I regularly remember when I'm talking to somebody about any type of belief where they're, you know, even on the fence about uh, questioning it or if, if it seems like it is causing a major issue in their life, you know, something like drug or alcohol addiction, right? Um, but anyways, I got one final question for you. And, Here's here's something that I've talked to uh, 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 with a few people, um, even Andy Norman in uh, the, the previous episode. So so I'm a major skeptic, and some some people, you know, even my therapist might say that I have you know quote unquote trust issues, but but I also pride myself in being pretty open minded and able to change my beliefs in light of new evidence. So at the same time, like every time I hear or read about a new study, my first instinct is, how do I know this is true? So th with this last question, I, I'm, I'm wondering what, what your thoughts or advice is on this. Do you think it's possible to be too skeptical or too open-minded? And if so, in your opinion, how can we find this balance between skepticism and open-mindedness? This is a terrific question. I think it's good to be skeptical. Um, I don't think it's possible to be too skeptical, okay? Science, uh, scientists are skeptical. I mean, philosophers are skeptical. Maybe it is possible to be too skeptical because philosophers are skeptical in that they are not even sure that sensory data are, are accurate. You know, uh, you can read Descartes, you can, uh, you know, you can read the Pyronian skeptics. I mean, read David Hume. He's not even sure that the sun is going to come up tomorrow or that the ground won't uh, swallow him up. He's not sure of, of causation or, you know, really anything. So science, the kind of skepticism that scientists use starts after philosophical skepticism. It starts after you're sure that uh, sensory data are more or less reliable, okay? But it is still a good question that you ask. Because there is this line between skepticism and open-mindedness, and it, it is a balance, and you have to walk that. Uh, Carl Sagan discusses this in his book, The Demon Haunted World. He has a very eloquent uh, passage where he talks about this. And basically what he argues is that scientists need to do both. You need to be skeptical of new ideas, because how do you know it's true before you've tested it? But you also have to be open-minded because new, how else are new ideas going to come to you, okay? And Sagan has really a joke in here where he says, you have to be open-minded, but not so open-minded that your brains fall out. Uh, and I discuss this a little bit uh, in the book, in which I really may try to make the point that science deniers are not actually skeptics. Everybody talks about how, you know, oh, well, aren't science deniers just skeptics? And when, when I talk to flat earthers, they don't claim that they're deniers, they say that they're skeptics. And, you know, why Why isn't it a good thing to be skeptical? Well, again, um, it is a good thing to be skeptical, but they're not actually skeptics. What they are is gullible, okay? 
they're too open-minded. They're so open-minded that, you know, Sagan would say their, their brains have fallen out. And what do I mean by that? Science deniers really have a double standard for evidence, okay? Um, science deniers are people for whom, if they don't want to believe something, no amount of evidence is short of proof is ever going to convince them. And you can't have proof in science, okay? But there's a flip side to this, which is that when it's something that they want to believe, they really don't need any evidence. They're really willing to, you know, make that leap of faith and believe something without compelling evidence. And that's where we've really got them, right? That's where you understand that science deniers are gullible. In, uh, pseudoscientists are also gullible. I mean, how else could they believe all of the things that they believe, as you talked about earlier with, you know, crystal healing and, uh, and dowsing and, you know, things like this, ESP, okay? Um, there are, in some cases, evidence that you can test in cases like that, and when the evidence doesn't go your way, you should give up the belief, okay? But here's the interesting thing about science. Um skepticism doesn't just mean that you disbelieve something when there's not enough evidence. It really means that you should be willing to believe it when there is enough evidence. And that's one thing that's distinctive about science. Um, I believe that they are uh, what philosophers call fallibilists, okay? Um, you are willing to believe something on the basis of good evidence, but you always hold in your back of your mind this idea that it might not be true that Newton can be replaced by Einstein, that Ptolemy can be replaced by Copernicus. These are scientific revolutions. These sorts of things happen. And it's not a break in science. It's how science works. So it's not to say that the people who believe Newton during Newton's time were wrong. Okay? It's not to say that they were um, pseudoscientists or science deniers. They just believed what they believed on the basis of sufficient evidence, which for the time was sufficient. It was still science. It was not fraud. It was not pseudoscience. It was not denial. It was good science. But part of good science means that they were willing to give up their beliefs when better evidence came along. So that's a really important point, I think, about uh, about science. And it's, uh, it's willing not just to beat something back when it doesn't have good evidence for it. It's willing to say the consensus of scientists right now is that this is true. So, and why that's important is because that's all you've got. That's the best you can do with empirical evidence. You cannot have proof. You can come asymptotically close, but you can never get there which is why you cannot say that climate change has been proven. The evidence for climate change is overwhelming. Okay? Um, a climate denier will say, oh, but it hasn't been proven yet. That, again, that's not how science works. There, uh, I read in Reuters not long ago that the evidence for climate change is now at the five sigma level. Okay, one out of a, There's a one out of a million chance that the science deniers, that the climate change deniers are right. Now, would it be rational with that one out of a million chance for a scientist to say, ah, I'm going to be skeptical, you know, I'm not going to believe it yet? Uh, no, it really would not be rational, okay? Uh, which is not to say that somebody, that, you know, there aren't questions that you can raise even about climate change, just like they raised about Newton. But here's the thing. It has to be settled on the basis of evidence, and your belief has to be proportioned on the basis of the evidence. That's not what science deniers do. That's not what pseudoscientists do. But it is what scientists do. Beautiful. I love it. So once again, Lee, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. And everybody listening, everybody who is tuned in right now, make sure you check out down in the description below. There is a link to Lee's book, The Scientific Attitude. And like I said, like I said, you don't got to be a scientist to read this book. It is, it is a healthy way to kind of view the world in so many different situations. And something else, here's a little surprise to leave you all with. But Lee actually has another book coming out August 17th, and it is called How to Talk to a Science Denier. And I was fortunate enough 
to get an advanced copy. So Lee will be coming back as we discuss that book. So I will link down to it below. You can pre-order it. So yeah, you have something to do. You can read uh, The Scientific Attitude. And then on August 17th, you could read How to Talk to a, a Science Denier. All right. But anyways, yeah, make sure you check down in the description below. I also have links to uh, Lee's uh, social media as well as his website and all that good stuff. All right. But before I let you go, remember, if you like this episode, if you are not yet, make sure you are subscribed or following the podcast. And if you're over on Apple, make sure do me a favor, do a little rating, do a little review. And what that help does is it helps put the podcast out on other people's, you know, phones and apps and all that other kind of stuff. Cause it's like, Hey, more people are listening to this. All right. But anywho, uh, yeah, if you want to support uh, the podcast and what I do in any way and support my reading habit, uh, I do get some advanced copies, like I, I mentioned with uh, Lee's new book, but I do buy a crap ton of books. So if you want to support the, the podcast in any way, check out the description below. Uh, you can buy some of my books that I've written. They're over on the rewiredsoul.com. You can become a patron. And there is also a link to Better Help Online Therapy. Um, as you've heard me mention in the podcast, I'm a recovering addict. I've struggled with, you know, depression and anxiety for most of my life and better help online therapy really, really, really helped me out. And you could do it from the comfort of your own home and it's affordable. It's, it's a win-win. All right. So anyways, check out the description down below and make sure you check out some of Lee's work and don't forget all week we are doing episodes. So tomorrow, tomorrow I am talking to Hugo Mercier about reasoning and trust and so much stuff. It is going to be awesome. So stay tuned for that. Make sure you're following me at The Rewired Soul and I will see you in the next one.